All right, good evening and welcome to our final session of the day. Um, this will be the Burnout Honors College and Lead Scholars presentation. So I will go ahead and introduce our two presenters for this evening. We have Dr. Madi Degario with the Burnout Honors College, and we have Dr. Stacy Malaret with Lead Scholars. Um, so I will hand it over to you both to do introductions and then begin your presentations. Uh, since our presentation comes first, uh, I'll, I'll take it on. Uh, I'm the assistant dean for the Honors College. I've been with the college for a long time. And I have with me, uh, I, I, I'll brag about her before she introduces herself, Ms. Brandy Blue, my younger colleague, who was a National Merit Scholar and top of her class. And she is so gracious to keep working with me for forever. <laughs> So that's us, and Brandy, I'll let you uh, continue. I just sure. wanted to talk about you. Oh, thank you. Um, my name is Brandy Blue. I am the Honors Admission Specialist for the Burnett Honors College. Um, I'm also a proud graduate of the program. I received my undergraduate degrees in sociology and psychology with University Honors Distinction back in 2004, and I refuse to leave. You can't make me. I think this is the best place ever. Well, my name is Stacey Mallorad. I'm the director for the Lead Scholars Academy, and I um, have been working here at UCF since 2001, and I'm also an alumna of the university. And here today, I have one of our current students, Ben Willett. So Ben, um, please tell them about yourself. Yeah, so I'm an undergrad here. I'm in my sophomore year or a second year lead scholar. I am majoring in statistics and I'm also minoring in information technology and I'm also a student athlete here on campus. So yeah, that's me. All right, thank you. So um, Madi, before I hand it over to you for your presentation, I did just want to remind everyone that we have our Q&A function here. So if you have any questions um, for Dr. Degario or Dr. Malaret, um, you can go ahead and submit those and we will address those at the um, end of their two presentations. Um, so I will hand it over to you. All right, so I'm going to share my screen. All right, I hope everybody can see it. Correct? Okay. So what I'm going to try to do is to cram as much as possible in the time that we have so we allow for, uh, for you know, questions and answers. So I'm not going to belabor some of it. I just want you to tell I mean, I wanted to tell everyone that we live by this. So our job, I'll translate it, is we get a, a, a bunch of very talented, driven young people. As my dean, who is an economist, puts it, we need to add value. In other words, to make them accomplish more with us than they would otherwise. So that's what that whole thing means. So, and of course, Everybody, the first question, the natural question is what's, what's going on with the Honors College? What's, what's the curriculum? What am I supposed to do? And I always joke and I say the requirements fit on a, like a little piece of paper. They're very easy to, to follow, easy to understand. We ask students who are in the Honors College, yeah, we, we want them to take a bunch of Honors courses before they graduate. That's about it nothing else, we don't have check boxes, we don't have you shall do that or else or something, other than of course you have to keep a decent GPA because that's why you're an honor student and to take honors courses because that's why you're in the honors college. And here it's, it's the minimum. That's what you have to do to graduate with university honors. Most students take more than the minimum because because, because there's a lot of value in taking honors courses and smart kids quickly figure out that there's a lot of value in taking honors courses. So how are honors courses different? We get this question again and again and again, because there's a lot of anxiety, not a lot, but some students have the anxiety they're floating that, oh my God, I did IB, I did this, I did ACE. Do I have to punish myself and keep doing it forever and ever? And our answer to this, Brandy's nodding, I mean, not nodding, like disagreeing with the statement because she was an IB stellar student, top of her class in high school. 
and she had this anxiety as she came in and I always uh, she says you know like okay this is not IB 2.0 or AP it's different the qualitative difference in honors courses does not translate into two three times more material as much as the type of stuff that happens in an honors course and this second bullet is probably the keyword you get to talk to people, to your professor, with your professors, with your peers. There's no zero sum game. Everybody, if they earn it, they can get an A. There's no penalty for being in an honors course. It's quite the opposite of it. Um, and uh, I, I, this belongs in many places, but it's here because it's here to tell you that you have a lot of latitude and choice and you can plan your courses not just earlier than a lot of other students but also for a year in advance and i keep calling this a tool not a privilege because the hope as i said is that you will use that opportunity in, in the wisest and, and and most advantageous way not just to sleep late on three days a week um, Lower division courses, in general, we have over 200 honors courses. So when I talk about honors courses, I mean honors versions of courses that exist at UCF. And, you know, English, calculus, all the good stuff. Um, calculus, calculus, physics, good stuff. So they have, I mean, we, we offer a whole spectrum of courses. And I call spectrum, I mean, what I mean by spectrum is the span from humanities, hardcore humanities, philosophy, literature, all the good stuff, all the way to the hardcore calculus, physics, biology, chemistry, and the other things. Lower division does not mean easy classes. Students take lower division because they need to finish their gen eds honor students, or because they need a specific prerequisite for upper courses, upper division courses in their major. So mind you, organic chemistry is lower division, differential equations is lower division. It's not a like, oh, blah, blah, blah courses. Uh, that's not at all. So, and again, I'm not, I can't list all of them. All the courses offered in honors are visible on our website. What makes us stand out in the honors landscape of the United States in many ways, and I know this because I work on this thing, reports, whatever, that's half of my life, uh, is the fact that we have not just lower division, which is easier to find in uh, other honors programs, but we also have upper division honors courses, very esoteric specialized upper division honors courses. And why is that? important it is because it you don't have to bend over backwards or try to fit and make it work honors things and the major things oh, what do i do now it's a very natural progression into your major at the same time fulfilling honors requirements it's what you do so we have upper division engineering courses like real, real specialized, everything from statics, dynamics, material science, electrical networks, all kind of good stuff, computer science one, two, machine learning, stuff that you would have to take anyway. Especially, we focus especially on the juncture point where you're, you're, you're graduated from your pre-whatever major, and now you're into your major and you really have to hit the ground running into your major with the courses that everybody in that major in that college actually has to take. So we have those in honors. So you continue to have this connection with your peers and faculty through and through. And the people you have to learn how to love most are, of course, your roommates and your peers, your faculty because they're the ones who endorse you, write letters of recommendation for you and do all kinds of good things for you. So getting to know them, the, the more honors courses you take in your lifetime, the more you get to know faculty who can write these amazing letters of recommendation for you because they know you're in a different context. We have 
similar batches of courses for life science, a long list of them, and business courses and all kinds of upper division courses like that. And we'll, as I said before, honors courses are different in the size, but it's not just the size. Because that's another thing I tell students all the time, there's a huge value in being on a large campus. Just the sheer number, it's mind boggling of faculty, people, areas of research, projects, things that are going on, you have access to them. Honors tries to make it even easier for you to have access to them and makes you stand out because you show just by being in honors, I call it fire in the belly. That's whatever, the, the tenacity, the, the interest in academic things, not just the academic performance itself, but the curiosity, the, all the other good things, the qualities that they're looking for. I love this one because this is actually the coolest thing that we do. And I keep repeating whenever I read uh, the proposals for seminars, these are always fresh. They have to be by definition. That's another value of having access to faculty of all kinds of colors, denominations, and everything you want to, especially the young ones are super excited to get to, to meet on our students. These courses do not exist for the rest of the campus. So they're unique to the Honors College. And here we're not that special. All Honors programs in the world will require at least a touch, if not more, of interdisciplinarity. Because that's the meaning of an Honors degree. It's not just that you have great grades, but compared to the next student who is not in Honors or not doing a special program, you have great grades and something else. This exposure to other things. Heck, serendipity is my favorite concept in the world because you run into ideas that you never thought possible just because you took an interesting seminar in sports business analytics. I'm just picking one at random. And mind you, we have to update these all the time because that's what seminars do. They get refreshed. There is one course that doesn't belong to anybody's major. And it is the course where we create a class, a community out of strangers. And here again, we're not unique. A lot of special programs, some universities at large in for, I ask everybody to go through this boot camp of sorts for freshmen because there's a lot of research and all my colleagues tonight and before would probably agree and you know, say it over and over. It's like in the army when they said those horrible things, which is kind of true. You look right, you look left. These are the people who you're fighting for or working with, not the boss, not the professors. And there's another sad truth. It's sad because I used to believe that professors are it. And it, they're not it. It's the peers that are it. The, you learn probably as much, if not more, from each other than you learn from us. So symposium is the first step. It is a, it's a continuum of things. It has a lot of different elements meant to, to get you started. It's, not, it's just the beginning. Listen to smart people. Be part of a team with an upperclassman who's also a very smart person. Learn what's what. Make friends. Even if you don't make friends in your team, at least you know people in your team, but most people make friends with their team. Hear what's, what's out there and start thinking about it. Work on your LinkedIn account, work on your resume, do stuff that starts the first steps. Because I'm old enough, I can say this and I will repeat it until I die, four years go fast. Trust me on that one. And Brandy should agree with that because we look at our kids and we see that um, four years fly. And the most important thing that you can do if you want to fly high when you graduate from college is to realize that. You don't have to rush and try everything your first semester in college, but you do have to start thinking about the things that you should be doing in college. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with the symposium. These are, it's a sample of lectures. Again, we get most, uh, 
if not all the presenters are faculty very excited about some the project of their lives, but we also have very successful alums who are talking about the project of their life. Um, it's very exciting to see people I admitted uh, a while ago who are now presenters in the, in the symposium. The team leaders are the go-to people. It's a very cool group of kids who find the wherewith, they have the wherewithal, the interest. It's a comp competitive thing to actually share this love of everything college with their freshmen. And Brandy talks about it in different ways because I never lived on campus, but she says, well, they can even get questions as, as interesting as how do I do my laundry? Do I put pink things with black things and what's going to happen? The part that is to me personally, the dearest to my heart is what we call discovery because it's not a better word for that. The things that you learn when you're not in the classroom, but on a college campus, or not even on, I mean, in an academic environment. The, we call it undergraduate research. There has to be a name for it, but it doesn't have to be a very formal process. We do have, though, a whole office that helps you figure it out for some career goals, for some professional goals. Uh, Research is a must. It's a it's the it's hidden in there. It's never spelled out, or not many times spelled out as a requirement per se, but it is there for medical schools, law schools, all kinds of PhD programs. Why? Because it, it shows qualities that just taking classes and checking boxes is, is no never going to show. Tenacity, stick with it, itness the quality of the letters and endorsement that you get from your professor, understanding how the, the sausage is made. If you are becoming a physician and you did research yourself, you're going to understand the quality of different research papers. Not to mention the fact that a lot of good medical schools require research to, for, from all their medical school students. Why? Because the next step is residency and matching, and all of these programs also want to see research. But, but we do not require it. That's another unique feature, not unique, but it's not. Many honors programs will ask everybody to write a thesis. We don't. Why? Because there are many, many ways in which you can work on very exciting projects, but not in a format or in a, in a context of writing a traditional thesis. Uh, a very high percentage of our engineering majors, for example, do internships. Many of those internships are in places where you have NDOs, non-disclosure NDAs, non-disclosure agreements, where you can't even write about or talk about what you do. Does that make it less? No. That's why we don't enforce the rule. However, we have a whole office that helps with that, and we encourage that through all kinds of mechanisms. Match days, contacts, you write a thesis, that's, that's your people, that's your peeps. You even want to think about it, even if you don't do it, that's where you go. Scholarships, all kinds of goodies. And the thesis program can be done in your major. And the most exciting one is outside your major. I have now a pre-med student who's writing a thesis in astronomy. Get a load of that. And there's all kinds of very interesting things at the boundary between top uh, disciplines. So you can do it like that. We have mechanisms and platforms and ways in which you should hear about what's out there and oh my god look at this professor in a totally different college who's doing research in a very interesting thing that I'd like to do um, and again that's just a sampling the cool thing is once you do research is published you're a published author how cool is that it's one of the most important oh my God, feelings in your life, if you do that. And this is just a little movie because it's not 
you know, you have to go live. I just wanted to show you where to go. People from all over the world, oops, download your thesis. Look at that. That's where like the whole world downloads of undergraduate thesis. And that was in like November. The numbers are going up as we speak, especially during the pandemic when people don't go anywhere. Engagement is, I'm rushing a little bit because I really, really want to have a little bit of time for Q&A. And I, a lot of the, the information can be found on our website, but I'm really trying to kind of give you the skeleton of what the Honors College is all about. The, I could talk about research until tomorrow, because that's one thing that, you know, I truly, truly believe in. On the other hand, I do know extremely successful students who did a lot of things, but not a lot of research. So that's okay too. Engagement is the third pillar of what makes a student successful. And my colleagues in the LEADS program will continue talking about this because that's, they, they do this very well. We do it too. What we mean by this is not just uh, engagement with each other, but a lot of other forms. But I'll start with engagement with each other because I do know that the kids in the room, in the virtual room, will ask themselves, will I have a life if I'm in the Honors College? Will I be completely out of the like the fun universe of the universe? And the answer is no. The Honors Congress is the, the fun part of the Honors College, but it's not just fun. It gives opportunities for creativity. Our students tend to have way more than just one major interest and gift and skill. They play instruments, they are artists, they're all kinds of things. So yeah, they may major in mechanical engineering, but they also major in music and they perform and they do all of the above. So I give you some examples. Of course, some of these things change and become obsolete as the pandemic changes, but this is the type of things. And again, every generation, every, every new class brings more ideas to the table because why not? Um, a lot of the activities show some goodness of the heart because that's what honor students are doing, philanthropic uh, drives and, and, and uh, initiatives and projects, but a lot of them are just for fun. Just so you know, just saying. Uh, another interesting benefit of getting and staying involved with the Honors Congress is that you can run for office as, as, as soon as your first year in college. Having an officer position in a college level student organization is always a good thing to show the world on your resume, on your CV, and by the way, the thing about CV and resume is something we really, really, really talk a lot about because you have to start developing your professional or pre-professional persona as soon as you come to college. And any time you update your resume and your CV, you actually check yourself in the mirror and say, wait a minute, I have nothing under this category that I should have something to talk about. Okay. We hope that you do things and we know that you will. How do we help you? Remember value added? Um, that's what we're trying to do. Advisors are one category of people that will be your BFFs for, for a while because they do way more than just show you which course to take to graduate. And I have another very lame joke. If you can't figure which course to take to graduate on time after one year, we shouldn't have admitted you to the honors college because that's easy. That is one of the easier things. The more interesting questions are about what do I do with my life? Or my dream is X, how do I get there? Should I consider doing an internship and then research or all kinds of things like this. Our advisors help with 
a lot of things. They put together some workshops. They, they make sure that Brandy is just a top score in all tests possible in the, on the face of the planet. And she's taught in GRE courses and she's uh, running workshops on all things GRE. How do you start? When do you do it? Blah, blah, blah. You know, and we have all kinds of things like this. Why? Because even very, very bright students sometimes need a nudge or at least um, a wake up call or basic information because if you're smart, it doesn't mean it doesn't mean that you know everything. Heck, I don't know. The more I know, the more I don't know. And that's how it's supposed to be. The Office of Honors Research, they run everything thesis. You can write a thesis in your major, you can write an interdisciplinary thesis, uh, you can write a creative thesis. In other words, if you write a book, that could be your thesis. Uh, and again, my colleagues are always there in your face, so to speak, talking about not just the thesis and research, how do you do this, but also bringing people to the table, faculty interested in getting students, students interested in, in getting faculty, awareness of where to look for a good research mentor, how to do it, that's their job. And we also have that is a big one. The idea behind getting, remember value added, I'll keep saying this until you get sick in the head, <laughs> is to get students who didn't even imagine how far they can go to imagine that. The Office of Prestigious Awards is the place where you have conversations where they push it down your throat about prestigious awards. Those are the national level, big name things that you probably heard of some of them and not all of them, whatever. We're top producer of Fulbright Scholars of the nation and the top producer in the state. We had a 16, it was record number of uh, National Science Foundation graduate fellowship finalists and semi-finalists this year. And four gold water scholars, that's for STEM. Uh, only three other universities in the country got five and were, that's the very rare thing to get four in one year, uh, et cetera, et cetera. These are scholarships and money, astronaut scholar, all kinds of things. A lot of them are for STEM, but not all. And they're typically for students after they graduate from college to pursue whatever else they want to pursue. But it could be monies that come to you while you're in college. And a lot of times, you know, riches beget riches and the same student gets all of the above, which is kind of annoying. But because, you know, you'd like to spread the, the riches. Um, so besides my colleague, Morgan Bauer, who is the director of the Office of Prestigious Awards, uh, now we have almost full time a former alum who is a Rhodes Scholar, who is now faculty in the Modern Language Department, um, Tyler Fisher, who is also working with students. Uh, he's specializing more and more on the uh, UK, Oxford, whatever scholarships like Rhodes and those. Uh, and it looks like we'll we'll have more people joining this, this office because that is something we know that a lot of you can get there. The idea is to make sure that you hear the word and to think about it and start as early as possible. But we also have, I call them the stepping stones sometimes, our internal scholarships, a lot of them. It's not the kind of scholarship that gives you an amount of dollars every semester while you're in college. It's a different type of thing. You apply for them to, and typically to accomplish something or to reward a certain type of activity, research, to help with study abroad. And even the ones that don't miss, it, of course, undergraduate research, because it's a big one. It, it, it's not a, just the one kind. It's not just for STEM. It's not just for humanity. But in general, students apply and they get them because they want to do something above and beyond their typical four-year experience. 
What makes me very excited is that some of the names, I shall not name them on this list, on the, the two slides are names of former honor students who feel so strongly about how honors made them what they are that they really wanted to endow a scholarship to make sure that other students are doing. And this is remarkable for such a young college and a young university, because we're young in the big picture. Heck, I'm young too. So privileges, I hate the word privilege with a vengeance. I tried to, all kinds of thesaurus, <laughs> but it's, it's there. It, it, there are some privileges that come with that. Of course, early registration is always a plus, but I, the way I th we think about it is that, yeah, if you want to do that internship and then research and apply to be a team leader and do that, you better have a schedule that allows you to do all of the above. Hence, the registration privileges. Uh, of course, library checkout is, it seems like a last century, but trust me, you'll still need things. We have a lot of, um, the whole building is designed to be a hub, a community place. It's all, it, it, it was radically redesigned with the pandemic. And I'm very excited to hear, to know that starting fall, the building belongs entirely to honor students after 6 p.m. There's no classes taught in there. So you can work on projects, you have printers, you have, of course, it's everything is Wi-Fi and so forth. Uh, but the people, it, it's called hack series. It's not just that. It's the people who want to talk to our students. Very exciting people, very accomplished people, people who hire people. That's, we had Harvard Law, Emory, Georgia Tech, all kinds of people come to talk to our students because the word is out. They're great, great grabs. And of course, you graduate with university honors, you get a, a medallion, a banquet or a ceremony. Right now we had a beautiful ceremony without a banquet because we can't do that. Um, we, I, Brandy and I were there on Friday. Uh, it was really exciting. And students in our honors, our, our graduates go places. This is just what fits on a, on a screen without cramping everything in like in a very small font. These are samples. We update them as students go. Um, they go places, graduate professional schools, or professional means law, dental, or health, whatever. Um, they serve and they get jobs. That's another exciting part. And I don't know how many parents are out there today, but they're probably going to be very happy to hear that kids get jobs once they graduate from college. And even in the time of the pandemic, we had very nice uh, outcomes um, about that. I'm not going to, again, right now, uh, it's actually our application deadline has passed. So but information and stay, and I heard it before, read your emails. We have a, um, myhonors.ucf.edu is like myucf.edu where you can check your status, stay in touch with us. Our class is getting full really fast. Uh, it's first come first serve when it comes to reservations. So yeah. And I hope that we'll have, I mean, I, I rushed a little, but I really hope to have a little bit of time for Q&A, if that's okay. Thank you, Dr. DeGario. Um, we will have some time for Q&A, um, but I do wanna go ahead and pass it over to Dr. Malaret um, to talk a little bit more about the Lead Scholars Academy. And um, again, then we will open it up for Q&A at the end. At the end? Okay, good. Yep. Yep, so thank you for your presentation. Dr. Malaret, whenever you're ready. Right, um, if you don't mind, I'm going to share my screen. Um, and, oh, perfect. All right. Well, welcome everybody um, to Lead Scholars Academy. Ben and I are excited to let you know all about our program. Um, we're going to let you 
know about what the program is about, a little bit more about our LEAD family, um, benefits of LEAD scholars, and how to apply at the end. So I'll go ahead and get started. And Ben, do you have anything to say before we get started? Oh, I'm ready to go. Let's get it started. Okay. So we're going to start with a video that showcases a little bit more about LEAD Scholar. So you can see a day in the life of what a LEAD Scholar um, Academy student um, might experience. So um, I believe, um, Hayden, you might need to um, help me. I believe that you would be able to hear it once I play, but just let me know if you're having trouble. All right, will do. Is to develop oh, UCF. Hello, and welcome to the Lead Scholars Academy. My name is Dr. Stacey Melloret, and I serve as the director for the program. Lead Scholars Academy offers a two year program for a first year student that focuses on academic leadership and community service. The mission is to develop. UCF's next generation of leaders. Hey, I'm Chris. I'm a second year student here at UCF. Behind me is our lead lounge, where we have our lead classes posted every single week. Students are also able to come here 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. to either study or attend social events. Let's go check it out. Hi, I'm Maddie. And I'm Sean. In LEAD, there's always new opportunities to make friends, whether it's playing We on Wednesdays in the lounge, going to leadership retreats, tailgating, playing I am sports, or going to movie nights. There's always fun to be had. We also have a couple of large events too, like family weekend, graduation, formal, and leadership week. It's a great community to be a part of. Hi, my name is Sydney. And my name is Michaela. We're freshmen currently living in the LEAD Scholars Living and Learning Community. Neptune's a great place to live because of the newest dorm on campus. You get your own private bedroom and only have to share a bathroom with one other person. It's close to the pool, the gym, and dining hall, and we get to live with all of our friends in LEAD. It also helps with our studies because we're constantly surrounded by people who are just as passionate about class and LEAD. Hi, I'm Hershey, and I'm a second-year LEAD Scholar. Something unique about our program is that it's designed to promote leadership across campus and beyond. You can find lead scholars involved in all aspects on campus. I'm Nicole, and I'm a member of Alpha Delta Pi sorority. I'm Ross, I'm in Ultimate Frisbee. Hi, I'm Akila, and I'm the movie night director for UCS Homecoming. Hi, I'm Danielle, and I'm in the Honors College. I'm Avery, I'm a resident assistant. I'm Cassie, I'm in ROTC. Hi, I'm Jess Martell, and I'm a member of the Pre-Professional Medical Society. And I'm a lead scholar. And I'm a lead scholar. And I'm a lead scholar. Hello, my name is Dr. Jermaine Graham, and I am the Associate Director of the Lead Scholars Academy. If you are an incoming freshman with a passion for service and helping your community, we hope that you will apply to our program. Please visit us at lead.sbs.ucf.edu. We look forward to reviewing your application. Hope to see you soon. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of an insight to what um, LEAD Scholars was all about. Okay, so I'm going to introduce our staff and a little bit about who works in the office. So that's me, I'm the director. I've been working with LEAD Scholars since 2001 and I love it. Dr. Graham, who you saw in the video, serves as our associate director and Dr. Torres is our assistant director. We also have lots of other um, people here to support us. We have four graduate assistants and D.B. Dimitri, who's our administrative assistant, who helps run our office. Okay, some quick facts about LEAD scholars. Our top three majors are biomedical sciences, psychology and health sciences, but it really doesn't matter what you major in. We um, believe that leadership helps you get to the next level wherever you your future may take you or whatever you may be majoring in. Um, about 12, um, between 12 um, to 13% of our students are also in the Burnett Honors College. And here are some other 
quick numbers for you. We had a cohort of 303 students last year. Average um, RSAT score for fall admit students is 13-14. Um, ACT is just under a 29. And um, our ethnic minority population is 52.8%. Um, some numbers that we're really proud of is our retention rate. About 96% of our students continue as sophomores. And our four-year graduation rate is 65%, much higher than the average UCF um, average. Our cumulative GPA after the freshman year is a 3.6. And our students do great um, things on campus, like half of our Presence Leadership Council members are lead scholars. Order of Pegasus always has a great showing, which is kind of like our Hall of Fame here at UCF, and thousands upon thousands of service hours back to the community. Okay, one thing that's important to note that as lead scholars, students will take a two credit hour leadership studies class every semester they're active in the program. So that would be fall and spring for freshman year, and fall and spring for sophomore year. Our classes are capped at 25 students, and we really teach students about who they are as a leader, what their strengths and weaknesses are, what is their leadership philosophy, and they really learn who they are um, as a, a leader and grow throughout those four semesters in that leadership studies area. Um, all of our classes are service learning designated classes, which means that students will do at least 15 hours of service as part of their class grade, reflect on that service in the classroom, write papers and presentations about what they're doing in the community, and really learn um, how to be a leader in the community, not just in the classroom, but put into practice outside the classroom as well. All right, I'll let Ben take it away with benefits. Yeah, absolutely. So one of the best things about joining Lead Scholars is our numerous amount of benefits that we have. So my personal favorite is the $200 fellowship or the stipend we get per semester. That is as long as you remain in good standing with Lead Scholars, you get your community service hours in, as well as you're participating in events around the Lead Scholars Academy. That $200, you can spend it on whatever we, whatever you would like, uh, mainly textbooks, food for the semester, maybe some housing. But I know some people that also have Disney tickets as well for the $200 stipend. And it's something that you can really do to basically just keep yourself at ease throughout the semester, just an extra $200 in your pocket. I know it's really important for a lot of students to have that. One of the other things, and I can't stress this enough, is one of the most important is priority class registration. We have multiple term registration where we can basically register for classes in the fall for the upcoming spring, summer, and fall semester. So it's a three-term rolling admissions. And that's really important because as UCF, it is one of the largest, it is the largest undergrad population in the nation. So having some of these GEP classes uh, is going to fill up fast. They're all going to fill up fast. So having this priority class registration takes your mind off of things and basically allows you to go with free of mind, knowing that you're able to register for classes and not be waitlisted or cut from these classes. You also have access to the Lead Lounge, which is an awesome study social space where you can hang out with fellow Lead Scholars and you also get free printing from that as well. We also have exclusive scholarship opportunities that only Lead Scholars can apply for. So that's awesome. And we also have an optional living and learning community on campus at Neptune. So going to the next slide. The Lead Living Learning Community. So just what I talked about, it is in Neptune, which is the newest resident hall on campus. It is an individual suite style living. So that means you get your own room, which is pretty awesome in college. Having your own room is nice just to go and study by yourself. You kind of want to be alone sometimes. It's very important to have that sort of just alone space. But you only share a bathroom with one other person, so it's not as messy and not as cluttered. And it's a great time. You're living with other lead scholars as well. You also have a common room on each floor that is fully furnished with a TV, a study space, and you also have a fully equipped kitchen. So if you want to cook meals or you want some mac and cheese in the microwave, you can definitely run down to the kitchen and go do that if you so choose. There is a central, we have a central location as well to the gym, the pool, the IM sports fields, 
the lead lounge is a short walk away, as well as one of our resident dining halls as well, 63 South. So on top of all of this, we have exclusive lead events and activities because one of the things that is most important to lead is being a part of lead and being a part with your friends in lead as well. And we can't stress making a friendships in lead is just so important. All my friends that I've known in college have been through lead and I really wouldn't have made the connections that, that I've had if it weren't for these events and these activities and the friendships through lead. Um, Real Retreat is really, it's a really awesome opportunity. Due to COVID, we were unfortunately had to move it to virtual uh, the previous year and we're still looking at COVID guidelines on whether or not it will be held in person or virtual. But basically it is a two day event where you're meeting up with lead scholars for the first time in your first year and you're getting to know everybody and you're basically going to learn about some of the base uh, foundations of leadership and the skills that we're going to be learning over the next two years. We also, it's also a good time. It's a sleep away. It's basically a camp out with uh, fellow first year and second year lead scholars uh, to meet your officer teams as well as the faculty on staff as well. We also have interest-based committees. I am the open house director. So I actually have a committee that would normally come and present with me in a normal year. We also have a committee for everything compared to athletic committees where we host IM events to where we also have philanthropy uh, committees where we also do Nightthon as well as Relay for Life, which are really awesome. So there's a committee for everybody. We have tailgates, which are really fun opportunities. If you're going to UCF, you're probably more than likely going to be a UCF football fan. It's a really big thing. We make it a big deal over here and tailgates are really fun to spend time with your friends. We also have socials, which are small little gatherings that we do. Uh, can be sometimes little fun Kahoot quizzes to talking about your day. It's really fun to just get to know people that way. We also have family weekend activities to really See your family, uh, see how you're getting along uh, and all that stuff. We also have lead formal as well as graduation. Lead formal is more like a prom and it's able to, it's again, it's a fun little social gathering. And we also have graduation, which is really important as a second year uh, lead scholar, you're gonna be graduating from the program and moving on to better things. And we encourage this uh, sense of graduation as well. You get. Uh, your little uh, med medallion, as well as it's just a fun little event to say goodbye and have a great time once again with your lead scholars. We're talking about Lead Scholars Academy. We are in no short of leadership positions, and that's something that is very important to the Lead Scholars Academy. Uh, I do apologize. Give me one second. All right, apologize. Technical difficulties there. But so leadership positions. We have full year director level positions uh, for second year lead students which are the Leadership Excellence Board, which deal with recruitment. So I'm a part of the uh, Leadership Excellence Board and I'm a part of the recruitment team here. And we also do the Lead Students Association, which help throw these socials and fun events for the Lead Scholars Academy. We have semester long positions, which are peer mentors for first year lead scholars. Now a peer mentor is basically someone that is there in your first semester lead class that can help you adjust to university life and basically help you through that transitioning phase. And it's really important. We also have short-term leadership positions as well, such as real counselors, which are going to be the first second year lead scholars that you will probably meet at Real Retreat. And it's basically good to connect with them to be able to uh, reach out to them as much as possible. And we also, which is to facilitate the two-day two leadership retreat. So that is for second years, but we also have first year leadership positions. So just getting to the first year uh, at Lead Scholars Academy as a freshman at UCF, you can definitely still have leadership positions. We have assistant director positions. Normally I would have one in a normal year. We would have director positions for everybody that has a committee. We also have the lead student advisory board. So what I talked about was the peer mentor for your first semester of lead. We also have, during your second semester, a, another first year lead scholar, basically within your class to relay information that's important to the Lead Scholars Academy as well as UCF. 
And we also have committee-based participation. So being a first year does not limit you to the amount of leadership that you are able to have. Well, um, so other accomplishments is um, the, like I said, the Presence Leadership Council, Order of Texas, service hours. That was, um, you know, the most updated number that we have. Um, our students are doing some great things. They're learning a lot about themselves. They're learning a lot about leadership. And then um, throughout their four years at UCF, they're accomplishing great things. So you might be thinking, how do I apply for this great program? Um, so I'll let Ben talk about the specifics. So our deadline is June 1st. Yeah, absolutely. So a little step zero here is you obviously must be, uh, must have applied to UCF and must have been accepted into UCF in order to really continue with this application process. So do that first. Once you got that done, which I'm sure most of you already have, uh, we have a resume that you must build up. And that's basically for your community service and your leadership skills that you obtained throughout your life. And for the most part, high school. Uh, we also have an essay response. We have a couple of different essay responses uh, dealing with your leadership to community service to uh, anything. There's, I think there's five or six uh, different essays that you can choose from for that. We also have a project-based assignment to basically tell us about your favorite leadership and your favorite community service you did. So that can either be through PowerPoint, a video, or it can even be through an essay. We also have a phone interview process. And that phone interview is really just to see who you are as a person and just get to know you a little bit more. And that's really important. And we also have optional letters of recommendation, which honestly is very recommended. And uh, all on the website here is where you can apply to the Lead Scholars Academy. And our early registration has passed, that was March 31st, but the regular registration is still available until June 1st. So you still got a little while to apply to the Lead Scholars Academy. Make sure you put that in your calendar. I know some people may procrastinate on that, but just make sure June 1st is the deadline for the Lead Scholars Academy. And we do a rolling um, selection process. So about two to three weeks after your phone interview is when you would know via email if you've been accepted or not. All right. Absolutely. Yeah, so you can follow us on Instagram or Facebook here at the UCF Lead Scholars Academy or at Lead UCF. We have uh, basically exciting and important announcements that we uh, hold on both websites. Uh, on Lead UCF, we've been pushing for the recruitment process a little bit further on our IG, where we've done some story presentations as well as uh, some Instagram lives on uh, getting to know the Lead Scholars Academy and getting to know UCF a little bit more. So every Fridays, uh, almost every Fridays, we do that around 5 to 6 p.m. Uh, so if you want to stop by and ask any questions that you have for the Lead Scholars Academy, I highly recommend it. But go follow us. Thanks, Hayden. All right. Well, thank you, Dr. Mallorette. Thank you, Ben. Lots of good information there on LEAD Scholars. So we do have time for just a couple of questions. So um, I'll just kind of group a few of them together. We did have a few people ask if they could be a part of both programs and how it is to balance um, being a part of the two programs, if that is a possibility. Yeah, um, like I said uh, in my presentation, about 12% of LEAD Scholars are also in honor. So, um, and I know I work with Brandy on getting those names every year. It's easy to balance the coursework regardless of your major. If you wanna do both programs, do both programs. Perfect, thank you. And um, Brandy, this question would be for you. I know we were asked, I know that the deadline has passed to be in the honors for this year, but is there a way to apply to be in the um, Burnett Honors College after your first year? So again, the deadline to guarantee consideration has passed. That was March 31st. Um, if you are a flying high superstar, well above UCF average, and you still want to apply late, you can request a late application at honorsadmissions at ucf.edu. Um, but we're looking for like the top 5% of UCF's incoming freshman class at this point. However, there are two other ways to join the Burnett Honors College. You can apply as a freshman during your second semester during March of your freshman year um, for our honors second year entry, which just means you would join our university honors program as a sophomore. You can find more information on our website, honors.ucf.edu. 
And then if you aren't selected for that process, we also have our honors undergraduate thesis program, which you can apply for once you reach junior standing. Thank you, Brandy. Um, question here, if you already have your AA degree, can you still apply for LEED scholars as an FTIC? Yes, because if you are graduating high school in the future, so in a month or so, you're still considered an FTIC students for our application process. Great, thank you for clearing that up. Another question for you, Dr. Mallory, a few um, questions coming in about the living learning community at Neptune and how that works. Um, is there a separate application students need to fill out for that? Yes, there is a separate application. Once you do your housing application, you can also apply for a living learning community. There are um, several different living learning communities offered here at UCF. And so you would click lead scholars. It will ask you, have you been accepted to lead scholars and why do you wanna be a part of this living learning community? Um, so that is all done through housing. Um, that application for living learning communities is currently open. So I would recommend if you have not applied to use yet or have not applied to lead scholars yet but want to live in the living learning community i would say do that first because housing goes by a um you know first come first serve process with when you apply for housing so if you are interested in lead scholars and housing apply for housing now through the living learning community application Perfect. Thank you for clearing that up. And to, for clarity, you don't have to live on campus to be a part of LEAD Scholars? No, um, actually, we do not have enough beds for all LEAD Scholars to live in our living learning community. So the majority of our students do not live in the living learning community. And I see a um, question here about um, if is there a greater housing cost? It's the same price for ne any Neptune room, whether you're in the living learning community or not. Wonderful, thank you. All right, well, it looks like we are pretty much wrapped up on our questions here. Um, I would ask if you um, have any contact info that you'd like to share, um, if you want to include that in the chat, um, if students have any additional questions. Um, otherwise, we thank you so much for your time, um, for answering all of our questions and getting through a lot of good information. Um, so um, just thank you again to all of our panelists. And we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. And I um, just wanted to let everyone know we do have one more day for our admitted student open house. So tomorrow will be the last day. Um, so we just invite you to come on back and join us. We'll be starting at 5 p.m. for our live from UCF Academics Edition um, tour. So we'll be doing that. We'll have a Compass and Excel session. And then um, a, a couple panels, we'll have some student panels and a parent panel. So we will hope to see you all back here again tomorrow. And then again to our panelists, thank you so much for your time and for all your information. Thank you for having us. Have a good one.